This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello everybody and welcome to the Liverpool Blood Red Podcast. I'm your host today, Connor Dunn, and joining me are three fine journalists. Well, two journalists and somebody that stands behind the camera. Um, <laughs> wow. On my far right <laughs> is Theo Squires. Theo, how are you? Not too bad, Connor. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. And Ian Doyle, how are you? I'm okay. I stand in front of the camera. Sometimes. Sometimes. Try, try to get up. <laughs> Not get away with doing it as often as possible, though. Yeah. And special guest who's been brought in yeah. for a different perspective on the games, Kai Delaney. How are you? I'm good. T- technically a video journalist, so I am still a journalist, just a different type. Okay. I'm glad you let everyone know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what a weekend it was for Liverpool Football Club. Um, first, they beat Bournemouth 2 1 on Saturday. And before we get into the finer details of that game, Last night, Manchester City lost 1-0 to Man United and Liverpool now 25 points clear at the top of the Premier League table. 2-0. 2-0. 2-0, oh yeah, of course. The final (coughs) final (laughs) minute goal for Tomlin's half-footed, side-footed volley. It's not going to make much difference, is it? What an exciting time this is, two wins away from the Premier League, Ian. How are you feeling? I'm feeling okay, yeah. I'm feeling as though there's a chance now Liverpool might win it. Um, <laughs> Better you speak to Adam Jones or not in his little predictor. Well, yeah. Has he got them losing it? Yeah, he had them losing it by five points. That's quite good going, isn't it? Even yeah. for an Evertonian. Anyway, going back to the... Uh, the yeah, it is... It's, it felt it's, massive, it, 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 Let's be perfectly honest. We can kind of say this now, but we've known for a while that Liverpool are probably going to win it, but because everybody's so nervous about stuff that's happened in the past, that nobody wanted to say it. And Jurgen Klopp actually fully, he said something after the game <clears throat> against Bournemouth on, on Saturday and he, he said something like did a little uh, you know when we win the league people will think this and then he caught himself and went sorry if we win the league mm-hmm. yeah so even he's I wouldn't say he's getting carried away with it none of the players are but you know it's now it's more a case of were Liverpool going to win it and when and with the results that have gone there's still a chance they could win it at Goodison on uh, next Monday which would be interesting I mean obviously City have got to drop at least three points in the, the two games they're playing against Arsenal on Wednesday and Burnley on Saturday yeah. but you know given the way that City appear to have you know not exactly thrown in the towel but there's there's no doubt that if they were six points behind rather than whatever, whatever it was 22 or 25, 25 yeah. going into the game yesterday that there's no way they'd have put in a performance that they did and I think, you know, United's had their tails up and they've got something to play for. I think City, other than the Champions League and the FA Cup, they're just coasting through the games a little bit. But that's not Liverpool's problem. Liverpool just had to, to win the game against Bournemouth. They needed to win it for their own for their own sake and because obviously they lost three of the previous four with a big game coming up against Atletico Madrid, which I'm sure we'll touch on a bit later on coming up on Wednesday. They need to get three points. Uh, and, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a decent enough performance. I mean... I saw some people moaning about it. It's like, well, hang on. They've just come through the first tricky period of this season. They've beaten a team who are fighting against relegation. Exactly the same as, you know, Watford, Norwich and West Ham were in the last couple of games. It's not going to be easy. Even if, the, you know, teams down the bottom, you're going to get games like this between now and the end of the season. So you saw, look, Watford, what a surprise. They got beat at Crystal Palace at the weekend. You, you, that, that's what happens. They, they, they get themselves up for these kind of games. And I thought... Liverpool, although, you know, James Milner had a very good game, cleared one off the line, you know, in the second half. I don't think Bournemouth were particularly great. I don't think Liverpool suffered that much in the second half, certainly when you compare to stuff that's happened, you know, against West Ham. You you go further back this season, you look at Brighton where they were 2-0 up and Alisson gets sent off, then it's 2-1 and, you know, Alisson didn't play again, did he, against against Bournemouth because he was injured, which, again, is something else I'm sure we'll mention a bit later on. But overall, you know, Liverpool is just now a matter of, just get those two wins. It's, you know, it's, you wrote a piece, didn't you, saying they didn't need to win another game, yeah, they and now didn't. they definitely don't need to win another game. It, I think basically, City are probably going to drop lose six eight points. Of yeah. nine, I, I think they could now. lose all the games; they'll still yeah. win. I think City have have gone, and they're just already in terms of the league, looking towards next season. Yeah, um, as a Liverpool fan, Kai, who has yeah. never seen Liverpool win the league in their life, I know obviously they were so far ahead after yesterday but still United beating City still felt big didn't it? It was it's, it's going to be it's one of the moments I think when people look back it's kind of one of the final nails in the coffin I think um, it's been done really for many fans I think since probably Boxing Day was the one where we beat Le- Leicester 4-0 City then lost to Wolves the next day um, that felt like a big moment and um, again I think United at home was but United beating City last night they're just so far behind as you say we, we can afford to lose so many games we need two wins out of ten? Eight? Nine two out of nine two out of nine yeah. it's, 
yeah, I think it's... Um, they've, they've lost like two in the Premier League in the last like 95 or something mental. Yeah, it's, it's just not going to happen. You see, there's been all the, um, over the next few weeks, kind of City with Arsenal coming up this week and then Burnley. So they play twice before we play again. They could easily drop points in either of those games. And then it just means we need Everton. If, if we beat Everton and... Um, the one after that Palace Palace oh, yeah. it's done isn't it so mm. it, it would be nice to get it done before the international break I think to to go into that with a full two weeks before we play City and then, and then get the guard of honour at City would be a, a nice little touch win at Anfield guard of honour City mm. be very pleasant anyway on to the Bournemouth game Theo and I'm going to take it in chronological order because the first obviously big incident was Bournemouth's goal um, it's 100% a foul yeah definitely it's a foul um, Joe Gomez he's not exactly a weak defender is he and he's been completely knocked off his stride there. It's just another one of these issues with VAR. It's like, what are the officials watching? How come there's such a delay to like, look over it and then they don't give it when everyone's there just expecting it to be a free kick to Liverpool? The defence practically stopped, didn't they? So if they're thinking it's a free kick, like Bournemouth, the sheep should looking over the shoulders when it's gone in saying, well, surely this is going to be called back. Even they probably didn't expect to be given the goer. It's just another sorry episode in the shambles that has been video technology this season. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think in a weird sort of way, though, it kind of gave Liverpool a little bit of anger? I know it certainly gave Klopp some anger on the sidelines just to go on and actually really go and hammer Bournemouth for the next 20 minutes where obviously they scored two goals. Well, in these last few games when they've not looked at their best, they probably needed a moment like that to kick them into life. And they're still not at their best by any means. Um, And it's definitely did get a response out of them because they did actually start the Bournemouth game quite well really we were saying I remember Dolly was putting in the dock that this is quite a good start compared to what we've seen in the last few weeks and then that just killed it entirely it's like hang on this is against the script this isn't supposed to happen this is supposed to be Liverpool getting back to their best and everything and granted it's come from was it the centre back giving the ball to Mane but Liverpool did need that moment a few weeks ago they probably scored more goals if we're really honest about it but it was definitely a win they needed yeah certainly so um Kai, I must mention one of the reasons you're here. Yeah. You are pitch side for every single Liverpool game. You're there with a the camera. You're yeah. pretty close to the action. What was the reaction like from the players when that goal was given for the VAR? Because obviously you're so close, you can probably hear what they're saying all the time and things like that. Yeah, I think it was a bit underwhelming. I think that is kind of where we'd miss someone like Jordan Henderson, for example. There was, especially from Gomez, there was so little reaction to the referee. He kind of looked at the ref and asked, you know, why was it not a foul? But it was, he didn't, you know, go about it. He wasn't in his face. He wasn't really pushing for it. But I think you know, Henderson would have been there. Would have, they would have certainly, I know they checked it, but there, there was, it was very under the radar. It was kind of, no, it's, it's not a foul, move on. But there, I don't think there was enough made of the fact and I think if he'd have gone down it's one of those you shouldn't have to go down to get the foul but I think if he had gone down and you, you're in the referee's face I, th- I think you'd probably get it yeah where we were in the press box you could see it was directly kind of like you yeah, know opposite us so mm-hmm. we could see the push we could see the outstretched arm and even when the play went on everybody in the press box was just going yeah this will get called back so they score and it's like this will get called back and we can see the, obviously see the replays that the fans can't see which again is another issue entirely but we can see them going through the replays and we can see them looking at the push and they moved on to the actual second bit was the offside and we're thinking hang on he's going to give this yeah Yeah, because he wasn't offside even though that was a borderline goal as well when when Wilson actually puts it in so there was a kind of sense of like disbelief kind of amazement you know it it didn't seem right for about 10 minutes and Klopp said afterwards he thought even the Bournemouth players thought "Hmm, what's just happened there and it did affect the game the Liverpool had started well Alex Oxley Chamberlain played very well he brought a bit of oomph to the midfield which perhaps was missing the last couple of games but you know, once it's interesting, isn't it, that the two goals that Liverpool scored came what I'd call old school Klopp goals, and the fact that they kind of pressured uh, Bournemouth into really making mistakes. High, yeah. yeah, yeah, they got a pie. And I know the first one was Mane uh, blocking at Jack Simpson. who would only just yeah. come on. I mean, we were at Bournemouth, weren't we, for the the away game before Christmas, and Liverpool started okay. It was nil nil, and then Nathan Ake went off. Yeah. Simpson came on. It's just unfortunate it was him again. <laughs> he didn't make any mistakes, but it kind of unsettled the defence, and the, Liverpool benefited from that again so that was you could argue that's a bit of a stroke of fortune although I think Cook Steve Cook got injured while trying to catch up with Firmino for the chance just before Liverpool equalised so it was arguably a piece of good play got him injured as it were but uh, the second goal Van Dijk steps out puts in a great pass and suddenly manages in and how many times have we seen him go through and he's he kind of painted that finish hasn't he that just you know opens his body so puts it into the bottom, in, yeah. the bottom corner 
And after that, as I said before, I didn't think Liverpool were bothered that much. And, you know, they may as well save the goals for for Wednesday against Atletico Madrid. You know, Firmino could have got one Mane at the bar. And when you actually write down the chance that they had, there's no, it's like every Liverpool Very similar game. similar to yeah. the West Ham game. It's like it's a, a loads of chances. Have Liverpool had a game this season that they've won where they didn't deserve to win? And the answer is no. And have Liverpool had a game this season where they didn't, where they lost, where they didn't deserve to lose? And you'd say no. And have to, how many games have they drawn? About two, two or three. United, yeah, United and Napoli, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and did they? And Shrewsbury, did they deserve to draw them? Yeah. So it's weird in this sense. This season, absolutely every result that Liverpool have had in their games has been the one that it should have been. You don't always say that. Yeah. I'll ask you just one more question on the the defensive issue and the kind of the VAR call. If that is ruled out. And it's, it goes back to your point, really, about Bournemouth not really offering, I didn't think, a lot. Hmm. I think Liverpool keep a clean sheet. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I know um, Adrian had to make the save from Nathan Ackie the head as soon afterwards, but that Liverpool were a little bit, not all over the place, but they were still a little bit affected by what happened. And I think there was another shot from, was it Stanislas, who kind of did that kind yeah. of save where he saves it, but it doesn't look particularly convincing. Yeah. But the point of goalkeeping is to keep the ball out and he didn't push it back into danger. So you can't criticise him too much for that. And said there was the one... Uh, incident in the second half were Fabinho which I know we're talking about him in a bit he seemed, will, yeah. he seemed to forget <laughs> that there were other footballers on the pitch for a minute and that allowed Bournemouth to win the ball back in a dangerous area ball goes over the top you know uh, Fraser lobs it over and then who's there the 97 year old James Milner racing back on his Zimmer frame to, to try and you know rescue the and successfully rescuing the situation I mean it's funny but at the time you just think oh he cleared it off the line well done so only when you see the replay a couple of times and you go, hang on a minute, he's proper full made up the spring, ground there stretch. and he's in in mid-air no. and he's full stretch got and he's got in. it off for a throw in, <laughs> yeah. So. That as well, so you watch the replay and you see Van Dijk's basically given up because like, he's just slowed down yeah. thinking this is going to go and Milner's still somehow got it off the line. Seems a great play. I mean, and, and I, I know Kai said perhaps Liverpool missed Henderson a bit, which they did in terms of leadership, but Milner was the one who they've also missed. So they've had the captain and the vice captain missing for the last couple of games and it's shown it for instances like that when Bournemouth scored the goal perhaps Liverpool were a bit shell-shocked you can imagine Henderson would have been as you say in the yeah. referee's face and you know and they're going to need that on Wednesday they because Atletico Madrid are just going to be which to be fair I quite like Atletico Madrid I quite like the way they play football you'd never guess that just winding up people I enjoy watching <laughs> that just like poking people just like prodding them until they have a reaction but What's the best reaction to all of that? Score goals. That's what Liverpool did against Bournemouth. That's what they're going to have to do on Wednesday. Yeah, certainly. And obviously the two goal scorers were Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane. Um, I'll talk about Salah first, Theo, because he has scored 70 goals in 100 Premier League games. He scored 20 goals in three consecutive seasons. First player for Liverpool since Michael Owen. And obviously 32 of those Premier League goals came in his first season at Liverpool where you think he wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, okay. Can you just give me a note on really, he has been sensational, particularly considering he's putting this output from the right wing. He's not an out-and-out -out striker. I think he's maybe been taken for granted a little bit this season just because of such a wonderful last couple and Mane's brilliance. But just a word on Salah, if you will. Well, this season, we've looked at Mohamed Salah and thought, it seemed like he's not scoring as many goals yet. He's now, what, one off leading the charts again. Yeah. This is just the consistency he delivers. 70 and 100 is astonishing. Granted, it's not Ronaldo and Messi figures. And that's probably what you now expect from those elite players. But how many players do go and get a goal a game? Or two goals a game, whatever. He is probably Liverpool's best Premier League player. I'm going to go and say that now, like up there with Steven Gerrard. Luis Suarez but he's the one who's going to have his hands on the Premier League title at the end of it that's a big shout isn't it better that's than it. Gerard and Suarez well, come on to he's that. going to have yeah. the impact isn't he Like you get, he's getting the returns isn't he and if you think you're looking at this in five, ten years time when you think of Liverpool's great Premier League moments who's the striker forward whatever you want to call him who's got the goals that's helped win the Premier League title Mr. Hamas Salah is that talisman in that team it's more than Sadio Mane even as Sadio Mane's produced these uh, more magical moments this year but whenever Liverpool aren't at their best or Salah's not at their best you still expect him to deliver goods, get the goals when you need them. And that's, you've run that many Why times. Why never get subbed? Why never, never get subbed? subbed. Yeah. Got and the moment in him. We yeah. saw that yesterday. Like It was a, well, yesterday, Saturday, sorry. It's a poor pass from Sadio Mane. I reckon if Liverpool were in form, Mane probably goes alone. He shoots himself. Uh, he's picked out Sire and he somehow recovered the play and then found the bottom corner with a really, really good finish on his stronger foot. And he's, that is the quality that he offers this team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kai, Mohamed Salah. Best Premier League player for Liverpool ever? I mean, Theo, Theo's point that he's going to be probably the top scorer this season we win the Golden Boot, I think that puts him above Suarez. He's already beaten Suarez's 
record for the 31 goals. Um, I think he's a player that probably will be looked back on more fondly than he is now. Um, I think if he had, he's almost had his Liverpool career the wrong way around. And if he'd have had 20 odd goals season one, a little bit more season two, and this year, if he'd be, if he'd got 44 goals this season and kind of kept climbing that, that chart, I think fans would appreciate him maybe more. Um, I also think if you, if you look at him compared to the kind of legendary iconic status that people like Suarez and, and Torres had at their time, they were probably the only, they were the kind of only world-class players we had aside from the your Alonso's and your Gerrards. Torres was the focal point of that team. Suarez was pretty much the driving force of 13-14. I think Salah is a cog in the best team in the world. You've got Mane scoring 15 goals a season. You've got Firmino. You've got all these world-class players. So it's not all on Salah. I think with Salah, it's almost become a victim of how good Liverpool are. So in that first season, teams didn't sit back and defend as deeply. Um, they weren't as hard to break down. So you think of like the Roman games, the prime example, how much space Liverpool got in behind that defence for him to tear them apart. They got so many goals. That game, tr- you thought that was before he was good. Before yeah. he was good. Yeah. Before yeah. he had the ego on him because <laughs> everyone knew how good they were. That is really since the two years since then, teams have to be a bit smarter when they defend against them. Liverpool have to create chances in a different way. And then that's more from the crosses rather than racing in. But how many times did he score 17 18? Salah, one on one, he scores. That's probably why he got the 44 goals. And it's what, showing that he's still getting 20 to 30 goals when he's now got two men, three men kicking him yeah. left, right, and centre. He's a quality player. Having said all that, what would Suarez and Gerard be like in this team? And you'd then, then, <laughs> then. If you then, yeah. Suarez in yeah. this team, then it's like. And then Ger- Gerard. So it's, it's hard well, to compare. Suarez is doing at Barcelona, wasn't he? Well, exactly. He exactly. So. Do you put Suarez in ahead of Firmino in this team? In this team, you can't really. I mean, it's, it's hard to say because of the way that they. Because of the way that they, that they be. exactly. Yeah, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're not going to go down that road because we haven't got enough time. We'll be here all day. But you know, it's very subjective about how good a player is. But you'd have to say that in terms of the numbers, that Suarez, sorry, Salah is Liverpool's best foreign player that's played. You take the point, isn't it? That, you know, he, he's scoring the goals, but the also there's something era, to show at the end of it. There's, there's well, there's that as well. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's scored, scored in the Champions League Champions final. League scored in the Champions League final. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's a it's a big debate and one for another day. But another player I want to mention is is Mane because I think particularly this season and especially since probably the winter break, I would say he's been maybe Liverpool's only consistently excellent mm. player. Um, he's going to be a big, big difference against Atletico as well, isn't he? Especially because given he got subbed at our time last time, which I wrote something last night that suggests that you know you can't say that Mane is much of a surprise package, but Atletico only played half a game against him and then for about 10 minutes of that, he was just not happy about where things were going. So they, they, it's like, yeah, they got rid of him that game and got 1-1-0, one, one really but then they haven't really yet. played against him. Yeah. So, and you, you know, it's funny, isn't it, that you, you think you know a player or you, know, you, you think Sadio Mane quite unassuming and... You know, he's very, very laid back and stuff like that. Certainly from when when you see him on television. But, you know, Andy Robertson said it. You've seen one or two examples recently that he gets, he's got a bit of a temper with him, like all the best players. You know, you think of Zidane, possibly not as much as Zidane, <laughs> like he's not going to go around headbutting people. But he's got a little bit of an edge to him. And I think that's why, obviously, why he got substituted against Atletico because Klopp thought they're just going to try and wind him up here and get him sent off. And it wasn't so much that he didn't trust the player, he didn't trust the ref yeah. to not deal with the situation. And rather than make a situation worse, he just made that decision. I'm pretty sure that if the same thing's happened at Anfield on Wednesday, he will not be subbing him at half time. No chance because yeah. he knows what he can bring to the team. And yeah, you're right. He's he's somebody that you know got the winner against Norwich, winner against West Ham, winner against Bournemouth. That's three winners. He's the only one that's carried on his form throughout that period. And he will have a bit of a point to prove because, you know, again, you look at the, uh, what was it, Robertson was talking about the Club World Cup final where, was it Rafinha went after him? Yeah. And he said, like, don't worry, I'll, I'll sort him out. I'll sort him out. But yeah, so in, in, in a sense, you know, that's good in terms of the camaraderie of the, of the players as a team as a whole. But that Mane, who's already in good form, had a great season. And I think Mike, him and Henderson are for the player of the year for me at the moment yeah. unless somebody does something insane like maybe Salah scores about 15 goals in the last <laughs> 9 or 10 games and might change things a little bit but they're the two best players and Mane will have a point to prove against Atletico and I think that if he ends up being the one who scores the goal that puts them through I wouldn't be surprised not least because he's got such a good record in the Champions League knockout 
stages. What yeah. will be really interesting on Wednesday is uh, Trippier's back, isn't he? So he's going to yep. be against a player he knows well. He's got the better of countless times before in the past. And Trippier, you're not going to be expecting to be as much of a wind-up merchant as the rest of the players just because it's not the English way, is it? If we want to go down that line, it's a more honest approach. So um, just going that would probably be the key uh, battle I'd expect in that game just because Trippier, he's a big miss for them. He's been such an inspiration for Atletico this year, getting his assist, crossing and that. It's why he's gone to Spain and he's got back in the England squad as a result of it. And he'll have a point to prove, having lost the Champions League final with Tottenham, it's the first real chance that a big English-British audience is going to be able to see him in action and not justify the move, but show, yeah, I've come on leaps and bounds here. And if Sadio Mane can do what he's done against him countless times in the past, it just shows how good he is as well. And Manny's obviously profited from all the we mentioned before about the attention put on Salah. That's why he's ended up being able to get all the, the goals that exactly Salah. get the goals that he's got. And if they're all now going to be big attention on Manny for this uh, this game, then perhaps Salah will get a bit of space and see what he can do. So <laughs> this is the problem that opposing teams have got and Liverpool don't have. So Firmino hat trick on Wednesday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's set to be some interesting battles, and we'll come on to Firmino in just two minutes. I'll ask you, what was the mood like pitch side? What was the mood with the players when they scored both the goals? Was it kind of relief? Was it celebration? Was it how was it? I think the as Doyle touched on earlier, the referee decisions, that just helped the atmosphere. I think Klopp's famously not a fan of the uh, Anfield atmosphere in the 12.30 kickoff. He actually came after the game and said it was the best 12.30 atmosphere since his time at the club. But that, that was helped massively by the uh, by the, the ref and the, that Gomez non-foul. But um, I think once, once that first goal went in, that there was never any really doubt that they were, they were going to go on and, and win the game. Yeah, some more positives to take from the game before we move on to a little bit of the bad. Um, Oxley Chamberlain, I was sick with you here, Kai. I thought he started incredibly brightly, gave Liverpool a lot of impetus, as Doyle has mm. already said from the midfield. And he looked like somebody who was actually going to make the difference in the game. Yeah, he's 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 the one, isn't he? With Henderson out, it's been kind of a battle between him and Cater for that spot. And obviously, Cater had had one game, didn't play particularly well, and then was out injured as well. Um, Chamberlain, if if you're looking for someone to you know, unlock a door. He, he's the creative midfielder in the squad, isn't he? Um, I don't know whether he'll play against Atletico. I mean, we'll come on to that, but... We certainly will. <laughs> <laughs> How did you make of his performance? I thought he was good. Um, I think he's been somebody else who's been a... I've said this before many times on this podcast. You never get a really bad game out of Oxide Chamber. Certainly not this season, but he's never absolutely brilliant. He's always like... Six and a half, seven and seven and a half, possibly sometimes an eight. And perhaps Liverpool have needed that over the last couple of weeks. And, and the first half, he did make a difference because he was the one in the early stages who was taking the game to Bournemouth. And the other players feed off that, especially when you've got other midfielders in the team that aren't perhaps reaching their level, which unfortunately Liverpool have got at the moment, which we may as well deal with that now then. Well, I want to speak about Firmino first. All right. Yeah. We kind of get progressively worse as we go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll come to you. I'll come back to you. Um, okay. Because we've been talking about Salah and the brilliance and Manny and the sensational levels he's been at, but somebody who has certainly not been at a fine level is Firmino. Um, it's a little bit of a problem at Anfield, I think. I don't think he's terrible. I don't think he's been terrible. I don't. I just don't think he's been absolutely amazing. I mean, he didn't particularly lose the ball that often. I don't think on, at least to, to my eye, on uh, on Saturday, although someone will now be listening and get called up the who scored stats. It'll be like, he lost the ball more than anyone else, you know. But I'm just on about, you know, from generally speaking from what you see, it wasn't as always losing the ball all the time. It's just that everything just seems to be a bit on the edge in the terms of it was just passive were just coming through. I mean, he, he had two really good chances, didn't he? The first one was a good save by the keeper. The second one he should have scored, yeah. which was the same at Norwich, wasn't it? He's got the had one right near the end where he should have scored. And, West Ham too, he had a couple in that one. Oh, West Ham as well, yeah. He was so, saying before the podcast, had 50-odd shots now at Anfield this season and not scored. So. That's, I mean, he's got close with quite some of them and less close with most <laughs> of them. But is he a problem? No, because there's no... I mean, who are they going to play instead of him? Who are they going to play? The only, the so only I asked you the question. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Ari can play down the middle, but he's been massively out of form lately, which mm. is unfortunately what happens when somebody doesn't play for a long time, which is an issue that Liverpool have had all the way through Klopp's. And, you know, even before then, it's like players coming in, but certainly under Klopp because of the way he likes rhythm and the way and teams play in a particular way. Minamino's not ready for that yet, I don't think. The only thing they could do is possibly put Salah in the number nine, which they've done, play 4 2 three, one, And then you've got the choice, do you play Firmino in the number 10 role or somebody else and just give him a rest? I mean, then it's like, does he need a rest? Because 
Don't forget, it was in December where he was absolutely amazing yeah. for about a month. He did really well in the Club World Cup. On either side of that, he was having a very good game. He scored twice at Leicester, I think. I think that's right, isn't it? He scored twice yeah. at Leicester in the 4 0 win, which effectively won them the yeah. league, which I'm sure we'll look back so at like that. Three yeah. assists against Southampton as well. It's really yeah. good in that one. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like it's been terrible all season or even, or even you know, the last couple of months. It's just the last few games. And because he hasn't scored in nearly, what was it, nearly it's 11 months, isn't it? Nearly 11 months at home. Uh, in fact, it's more than 11 months, isn't it? It's a year now, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's coming up to March the 31st. Yeah, I think so. So it's coming up to a year at home, which is insane when you're talking about a number nine striker for a team that's won 27 of 29 league games, <laughs> has won the European Cup, has also won the Super Cup and won the Club World Cup for their number nine to not score at home in all that time is slightly strange. But if you look at his goals and the ones they scored away from home, nearly all of them have been important to either first goals or winners. So he's not going to get dropped it's whether or not he just needs a little bit of a rest. I don't know when you're going to get there. I mean, if Liverpool get through this, perhaps there will be a scope for Liverpool to start resting some players because you'd like to think they might have the league sewn up by then. We were saying it in the office on Saturday, it's probably the worst time for Shaqiri to be injured because when Liverpool weren't at the best last season, that's when they went to the 4 2 3 1. That's when you saw the best out of him. But, but then maybe that's why Minamino's here now. Then maybe mm. they are going to give him a bit of a run. And you could even say Rigi, but as I say, he's out of form. It's interesting with them at the moment because whenever you have the Liverpool team drop and Minamino's in it, Rigi's in it, you're always expecting Rigi to be the striker, Minamino to be out wide. And that hasn't happened at all, has it? It's always been Rigi on the flank with Minamino as the false nine. I think well, that's probably what Klopp's seeing now does it mean he doesn't really want Origi as a striker he's or does not, he doesn't really want Origi full stop yeah he he's not Minamino trusting Minamino as the number Minamino. nine yeah it's interesting to see what he's going to do because I mean, it's going to be games that effectively don't really mean anything you can play them in both can't he? there's going to be opportunity isn't there yeah. well, once the league's sewn up especially if they're still in the Champions League um, they'll be rotating in the, the league games the only thing is if maybe they go out of the Champions League Klopp's got half an eye on that record he might stay with his full shot. And, and I'd imagine Manning and Sal will say, I don't fancy being dropped this week. I've got that gold yeah, boot to go for. Yeah. 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 Just go and share it again. Yeah. We obviously know all of the qualities for Mino offers and there's obviously no question of him getting dropped. But the point Doyle's made there and is absolutely right. If he does need a rest, they just can't give it to him. Not when you've got a league up for grabs. No, because he is not Mr. Liverpool, but he is the one that makes them tick. If you go to any fan, coach, pundit, whatever across the planet and you say, first player you think of when you think of Klopp's Liverpool, it's Roberto Firmino. He is the reason why Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah get the goals because he's just impossible to mark. He pops up all over the pitch and he's, we keep saying it with Salah and Mane, you take them for granted for how good they are just because of that quality. But Firmino is exactly the same. Here yeah, he might not get the goals, but why does he need to get 30, 40, whatever insane numbers you want when you two wide men are? If you think back to, let's say, the great Chelsea team under Carlo Ancelotti when Drogba was getting loads of goals, the wingers weren't getting goals in that team. And it's just how football's developed in the past 10, 15 years that those roles are reversed. The strikers now got to be more all round for the wingers to get them. It probably comes from Ronaldo and Messi. But for me, no, you're not going to drop him when he is your most important player. He's not measured on goals and assists either, is he? I don't think that's what... It's not what he offers, though, is it? He's, no. he's a lot more than that. That's probably the point I was he trying to make. Got, he has got really. more assists this season than last season already, I think. I think that's right. It's just in terms of, as I was saying, if he needs a rest... You can't give him a rest because he is so important to this Liverpool side and maybe then he's coming under a little bit of criticism not performing at the peak of his powers but they've not really got a lot else to, to back that up. Well, it's the debate as well with, um, with these things with Timo Werner. It's like, well, if you want someone who's going to come into that front three and be the quality option or the alternative, how do you fit them into that team if they're not offering what Firmino does? There's almost that fear that Liverpool without Firmino is not going to be as effective. It's probably the biggest compliment you can give him. Uh, it's just... what. He's one of those players, he's like Van Dyke, he's like Alisson. You just can't drop him when he's available. Yeah, certainly an interesting one. Another one that we can probably discuss at <laughs> a million lengths, but I want to move on. And it's finally time to talk about a certain Fabinho. Mm. Fabinho obviously was playing superbly before he got injured. And it's worth mentioning that it was his first ever injury in his career that he's missed more than one game. So you never know how a player is going to react to that. But since the injury, he has had... Well, he's featured in 10 games, he's played a fair few 90 minutes. And it's fair to say, Guy, it just hasn't happened for Fabinho, has it? No, he's, he's not been the same player since he came back. I think, as you rightly say, before the injury, he was arguably Liverpool's player of the season. Um, if he'd have kept that form up right the way through, I don't think anyone could have argued with even PFA player the way, the way he was going. Um, Henderson dropped into number six didn't they and really Liverpool up until a few weeks ago they didn't look back Henderson and I think in a way that's that might have impacted on 
Fabinho a little bit. The fact that Henderson's just, you know, he stepped straight in there. Um, they didn't miss him at all. I think they won every game while he was out. Um, it's just, he's taken a while to get back up to speed. Uh, I don't know what's going to, again, d- does he does he play coming up to Atletico? I don't know. Do you go with Henderson in there? Um, his form over the last few weeks has certainly been worrying. There was the goal um, against Chelsea. Ross Barkley just seemed to breeze past him. Fabinho's kind of jog in and it wasn't really there. Um, it's, it's certainly been a concern since he came back. He's, Fabinho himself has spoken earlier this season about needing to become more of a leader at Liverpool. Have you noticed any sort of change in him before and after his injury? Obviously, you're so close to the action and stuff. Have you kind of, has he shrunk a little bit? Is he less loud or has anything happened that's noticeable or is it just quite simply he's not up to the pace of it yet? I don't think he's ever been the most vocal player anyway. He's not one you see like a Van Dijk or, yeah. a, or a Milner or something who are kind of leading on the pitch. But he, he's one of those that goes about his business quietly but effective um, yeah, he's, a, he's a big presence he's a, he's a physical presence on the pitch um, I think there's been less of that you, I can't remember in too many games recently any big kind of big saving tackles or even with the, with possession he's not dictating play playing the crossfield passes like he has been um, I just I just think he's he's had that injury like I say it's the first one he's had for a long ever in his career um, and it's just going to take a few weeks for him to get back up to speed. It almost seemed, and as Kai pointed out there, Liverpool won every single game and Fabinho was out. And obviously he was eased back in. I think his first game back was Man United. He had, had 25 <coughs> minutes or so. And then he sort of was eased back in. The first few games were written off. He was getting back up to speed, fair enough. And then obviously Henderson gets injured against Atletico Madrid. And it would almost have seemed that Fabinho was perfectly poised after having a few games to step back into his number six role and, and make that his own as we've seen all of the centre-backs do time after time and other people on the pitch but just it just hasn't been the case has it? I think he looks unfit um, and that's obviously come from being out for so long because if you remember when he first joined arrived at Liverpool it took him ages to get back mm-hmm. up to the to get used to the the speed of the game and, and the, you know the, the te- intensity and stuff like that but he always looks as though he's out of position at the moment. Like a number of times you've seen recent games where the opposition has been on the attack and normally expecting Fabinho to be there in front of the centre-backs and he's somewhere over here on the wing. It's like, what's he doing over there? And it's like, has he forgotten where to go? But I just think it's to do with he can't physically get there. And I don't know whether that's because he's still feeling the effects, of physically feeling the effects of the injury or because he's had such, such a long time out, he's got that kind of, you know, f- fitness that, he can't just turn it on and off or it takes a long time for him to get up because you say he's never used to being injured because he's not had that before. So it's been a bit of a learning curve for him. But having said that, that's all very well. But as you said, he's had 10 games now. So now it's like, okay, Henderson so might will probably be back time. and Cater will probably be back. And Milner is clearly desperate for more game time. And Wijnaldum is there and Lallana's you know, played a couple of games and Oxide chamberlain Look, because suddenly, hang on, there's suddenly loads of midfielders here. I don't necessarily, this is Jürgen Klopp speaking, not me, I don't necessarily have to play Fabinho, particularly in a game against Atletico Madrid where we're probably not going to be massively defensive. We're going to need to have players who are going to unlock this defence while also being able to get back. So it's a big shout for him, especially when, you know, if they do get through, or regardless, they've got these games coming up in the Premier League where they can afford to... Okay, we can. We don't necessarily have to win average, absolutely every single game. We just have to win a couple. Let's just try something a bit different. We don't have to play Fabinho if he's not back up to speed. Play him here and there, and then, you know, it's up to the player himself, isn't it? Basically, I mean, Klopp will see him training. We don't see him training all the time. He'll know what he's capable of. But the positioning for me is the issue, not so much the hard tackles and the pass. And I think his pass has been okay. To be fair, I can't remember him like massively losing the ball, but it's the fact he can't get around the pitch. And that's a bit of a concern when you're a footballer. I'm going to cut him a little bit of slack that when he was at his best form before the injury, um, he, Liverpool lost him when they're probably in their form of the season and he's come back in when they're looking tired as a unit themselves. And it's almost like, I've said it for a couple of players on this podcast, you, you take him for granted as well. And I think his teammates take him for granted because it's easy to forget that as good as he played in that first half of the season, Liverpool weren't getting the clean sheets. It was only when Jordan Henderson stepped into that number six role that they started looking more secure defensively overall. And maybe that was part of the, oh, we've got to almost try a bit harder. We've got to be switched on a bit more because Fabinho is so good as a number six that they've got to compensate for not having him. 
And then when he's they've lost uh, Henderson, he's almost been thrown in at the deep end. You've got to be up to back to speed here. We need you at that level there. And he's got to get up to the pace again. And maybe the, his teammates have gone, because they've got that faith in him from what they've seen before, they can not do what they were giving the, him the extra support like they were giving Henderson, if that makes sense. So it's a hard one for him to call to get back up to speed. And also, if we want to touch on the mid-season break, that's probably come at the wrong time for him as well. Like, it's not just um, game time training and that you want that momentum. And Liverpool did lose a bit by having that couple of weeks off away from training and that. And Fabinho to still not be at his best after so long, it's a hard one for him to come to terms with when your team aren't playing well. Yeah, the point is as well, with Atletico coming on Wednesday, no player on that pitch can not be at 100%. I don't think they can afford to let Fabinho have another game to get up to speed. I think they probably had, they were probably, I think Klopp's probably given him so much game time to get him up to speed for Atletico, with Atletico in mind. And obviously, with, with that being the case, it's just, I don't think you can play him. I would have dropped him for this weekend. I'd have had Ronaldo as number six. Um, so if that was the case for the weekend against Bournemouth, I'd imagine it's going to be the same here. Like if you've got Jordan Henderson back, you're not going, if he's fit enough to start, you're not going to have him on the bench with Fabinho the way he's playing at the moment. It's just who you go for that overall package. But then Liverpool players, they have got that quality to turn it on when they need to. It could be one of those nights for him, but it's a big gamble to make either way. Yeah, it's obviously a big decision for Klopp, Kai. Um, as, as so many Anfield nights have gone past, players produce their most special performances on this sort of occasion. Yeah. But if you were Klopp, would you gamble with Fabinho? Or do you think, actually, with the games coming up that have sewn up the Premier League, that's when you can get him back up to the speed and just head into a new season? Yeah, I think you're right. I think if Henderson's fit and at 100%, you start him as the defensive midfielder. There's, as Dorley was saying, there's so many options. There's You've got Chamberlain, Milner, Cater, there's just one album, obviously. I, I don't think you need to, you don't have to play Fabinho. At the start of the season, he was arguably the first name on the tee sheet. But I think I would go with Henderson, one album plus one for me. Okay. We'll come on to a full team selector in a minute. But, Dolly, what are you expecting from the game? And Atletico, by all accounts, are a little bit concerned, aren't they? <laughs> They are because of what happened to them last year. They played, for anybody who doesn't know, they played Juventus at this stage of the Champions League 12 months ago and won the first game 2-0. And that was the one where Diego Simeone um, celebrated somewhat uh, animatedly <laughs> towards... I don't know who it was towards. Was it to the Juventus yeah, bench or his own fans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, uh, you'll have to watch it. You'll have to watch it, but he, he, he demonstrated his cojones, as they say. Um, <laughs> Circus Masters back at it. Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, they lost 3-0. I'm pretty sure didn't Ronaldo's got a hat trick. Pretty sure he did. Did he? Yeah, Our producer, did, yeah. we know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He got yeah. up there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we, we got the green light there for a hat trick for Ronaldo. Um, <laughs> but you know, Liverpool only one nil down. The thing is, it's that oh, they didn't score the away goal, did they? And I think with it being so close, I can't see it. Let's go Madrid doing anything other than what they did in the first game, because I think the way that the game, even when they scored so early they probably automatically thought, right, we just don't want to concede a goal now, this game and the next one. So the, the game plan is not going to change at all, I don't think. For 177 minutes. What will, de- what will depend on how they approach the game, though, is whether that how Felix plays, or Jao Felix, I should say, and uh, and Diego Costa, because I believe Morata might be injured. And, yeah. you know, Costa will... It's an interesting one with Costa because it could work one or two ways. Just being, him being Diego Costa could wind up the crowd so much that they, as the referee did on Saturday, it gives Liverpool a boost because he's just so annoying. Or it could be that annoying that he actually has a big impact on the way Liverpool defend and suddenly Liverpool step back a little bit because they're a bit concerned that he might actually do something. He's one of more the only for, strikers yeah, exactly, yeah. saying go for Van Dijk. Yeah, he literally physically just jumped at it, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah, and Van Dijk was like, what are you doing? Then he tried to apologise yeah, 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 yeah. and Van Dijk's like, get lost. So that would be interesting to keep an eye on, especially with Henderson as well. Henderson and Costa have got a bit of previous, although I'd imagine Costa can't even remember, you know, because he's got so many other things going. He's, he's got, got previous with absolutely it? everybody else. Yeah. yeah, everybody. So I can't see Atletico being any different to what they are. I do think they might have a little bit more attacking threat because of the players we've mentioned. I think that's something that obviously Simeone will look at because he knows, he'll think, if we score one goal here, it's over because there's no way Liverpool are going to score three. And But I reckon Liverpool go into the game thinking, we need to score three. But they'll do it like they've done so many times, stage at a time. 
you know, let's get the first goal. Let's see how we're going. Let's get to half time. All right, okay, let's see whether we get the second goal. Okay, now we're ahead. Now what are we going to do? And when we come to the team, that that's going to influence my team that I pick. Yeah, of course. Obviously, we saw against Barcelona in the Champions League last year, Liverpool scored three goals yeah. in the second half. And so that's what we're talking about, taking it stage by stage by I think stage. It's really. a bit different, though, because against Barcelona, let's be brutally honest, nobody thought they had any chance of doing it. And it was like, oh, we score one, let's see what happens. Oh, we score a second. Oh, hang on, with 3 0, you know. There won't be anything like that because all the crowd will turn up thinking, no, but we've got a great chance. Bit by yeah. Bit, yeah. If they're going yeah. to get anything from this and progress in the And that's time. why Atletico will look at it and go, the entire game is one bit. Don't concede. And he's the best team in the world at being annoying and not conceding. Probably them. If maybe not, if you look at this season as a whole, but over the last couple of years, certainly in Europe, the only the good thing for Liverpool is that Let's Come his away record in the in the knockout stage is absolutely rubbish compared to the home one. So they'd very, very rarely score, but they had quite a few nil nils. So it will be the onus, as we knew from the final whistle at the Wanda Metropolitano a couple of weeks ago when me and Kai were there, that it's gonna be on Liverpool to score at least one to get it to extra time or penalties and then see where they go from there. Well, they've never lost the home Champions League knockout match, have they? So that's Who? Good. Liverpool? Uh, let's go. Oh, let's go. Sorry, yeah. So that speaks volumes. Yes. But the club's never lost a knockout tie. Exactly. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly yeah. what I was yeah. going to say. Yeah. 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 Well, they'll both, both be happy, won't they? <laughs> yeah. That's how it Somebody works. Knows, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Liverpool going to need a fast start, I think. Yeah, they're going to. Be. They've got a fast start against Barcelona, if we want to mention that one. I'm really nervous about this one, if I'm going to be honest, just because Liverpool in Europe like being the underdogs, but Atletico probably the best you're going to get at being underdogs. And I reckon they'll score. And then it is just, what can Liverpool do? Liverpool have to get that advantage over them early on. They have to make that first mark. They can't be playing catch up here. It's one of those where Atletico will know how to play this game. Granted, we said with um, their history from last year, how they messed that up and they're fearful of doing that. It's similar to Barcelona, how they had, was it Roma? Roma, yeah. And then they did that. But it's just very different when you're expecting to win and when you're the underdog. And Liverpool have had that in their favour so many times in the past. And I think when you think back to the post-match comments after the first the first game, you had players, you had Klopp all going, yeah, but Anfield, 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 they're going on about it so much. It's almost like there was a slight nerves in their mind as well because it sounded a bit different to what we'd seen before. It would almost been rattled. So it's going to be very important who gains that upper hand in the first 15, 20 minutes and takes control of the game to how they can control the match, see it out. Because if Atletico get an early goal, they're going to feel confident. You know their away fans, if they're allowed to travel, are going to be very loud. It's a very hard one to call. I think one thing that <clears throat> kind of the way Liverpool reacted at the end of the game contributed to it was Atletico Madrid celebrations at the final whistle where they did a lap of honour but mm. it looked like they'd won and I think the players clogged onto that and of course the last team to do that against Liverpool in a, in a European game was Villarreal who celebrated because they scored fair enough in the last minute in the semi-final of the Europa League and Klopp noted that use it as part of his build up to the you know motivation for the second leg and Liverpool won three 0 Anfield blew them away and they got to the final. We won't mention the final, but <laughs> yeah. they got to the final, yeah. Andy Robertson came out, didn't he, straight after the game on TV yeah. saying they're they're celebrating like they've won. Yeah, yeah Van Dyke did time. it and Klopp said it as well in the press conference. So that'll have lodged in the, the collective brains of the people at Liverpool. Do you share the nerves, Guy? Yes. <laughs> um we we can't be in a position where you're two 0 up with ten minutes to go because it's it's yeah, they, they get a goal and obviously we need three. They're going to fancy a goal. Um, no clean sheet in five now for Liverpool. Alisson, despite all of Adrian's, yeah. you know, Adrian's obviously a great second keeper. He's going to be a huge, huge miss. And if, it'd be interesting to see whether that impacts the way they play at all. Um, they might think with Adrian they got a better chance of scoring. It might prompt them to come out a little bit more, try and nick one and might give Liverpool some more space to get in behind. But... Costa's just going to leather everything straight out of Adrian. I don't, I don't think that Liverpool are going to be getting in behind in this game at all. I think they're going to have to play through them. Even if they play the likes of Costa and Felix, I think they'll just, that bank of four with two sat in front, then to say, say to the other players, do what you want. It's not going to be one for the purists, no. no. <laughs> it's not going to be Barcelona, let's put it that way. Barcelona came, didn't they, uh, in the semi final and came to play and had a couple of chances, but it's not going to be like that. Get ready to be frustrated and annoyed. Do you think Alisson being missing will change the way Liverpool play? Do you think it will change the way Atletico play? Or do you think, the, I'm thinking maybe perhaps the defence might need to help Adrian out a little bit more than they would have helped out Alisson? In a way, no, because I can't see Atletico having a million shots. It's not like the Barcelona game where you would have missed him. Um, I think they will have, obviously they'll have, they'll, they'll have a go, certainly at set pieces. That's one thing Liverpool have to be careful. 
of, of defending because you know they got quite the last time they conceded the goal, wasn't it? In the first, even that was lucky, wasn't it? Let's be honest. But set piece concession, so they can have like Costa standing. On yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they got they got quite a few big lumps in the team. So I think that's where Atletico will be a threat. I mean, I'm just interested to see what their team is. To be honest, what's Liverpool's? Because that'll tell us a bit more about the way the game's going to go. I think you made a good point about Costa there. I think the the one thing you don't want to do or need to do on a European I Anfield is feed the crowd or give them any reason to be any more upbeat than they're going to be. And Diego Costa is going to play right into Liverpool's hands with that. Suarez did it last... OK, totally different. Suarez yeah, did it just by still. being Suarez and doing what I actually thought at the time was, you know, well, look, he celebrated a goal. Fair enough. You know what I mean? He's playing for Barcelona, but then that kind of fed into the, you know, the, I hate to say the word narrative, but I'm about to, narrative of that whole game. But I, just, I don't think it's going to be like the Barcelona again. It's going to be something completely different. And it's going to be... Yeah, it's going to be like a proper old school European. I could easily see it being 1-0 and going to extra time. And then, you know, it's like, basically it's like the Chelsea games again from about 10, 15 years ago. Going to be an interesting and nervy game for sure. The ever optimistic me is also a tiny bit nervous. Sorry, Are you nervous? A little bit. I'm not nervous. It's the game of football. Well, I just don't want Liverpool to lose, do I, to be honest. <laughs> I don't want to scar the Champions League, so you that. that's why. At least you'll be in there in a few weeks. No one will be able to watch the games anyway. No, that's yeah, true. Yeah. Well... That leads me on perfectly to coronavirus. <laughs> the under 23s were supposed to be playing tomorrow, weren't they? Yes. But that game has been called off. Because Wolfsburg, who they were meant to be playing in the Premier League International Cup, were reluctant to travel because they would rather stay safe. In Wolfsburg, where it seems as though there is no imminent threat, so rather than chance it, they've said stay put. And it's fair enough. One of the 110 people in the UK might Now, let's not, let's not do this. Yeah, you know. let's not get into the biggest no. reaction ever. No, it's we'll not. Leave it's that not where it is. It's not no reaction. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's talk teams. Obviously, Adrian is in goal. Um, Andy Lonergan, Champions League debut. Well, I mean, he's probably going to be on the bench, isn't he? Will he? Be on the bench. he will so, be on the bench. Yeah, because Kello's yeah. injured. Yeah. It's been another big night That's for him. That's the thought, that. You get a red card or some injury to Adrian and Lonergan's playing Champions League knockout against Atletico Madrid. Goes penalties and he's there. He's a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this could be, could be such a big night for Lonergan. Must be a snap analysis, don't anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, the defence, I think, we yeah. all know the four. Yeah. Lovren and Matic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Lovren and Matic, can't wait to see it. And the they midfield to... is where I think all the questions are because the front three are going to be the front three, mm. clearly. Everyone's in agreement go to the Go to these first. Okay. <laughs> the midfield three, Theodore, Sebastian. Uh, Barnaby. Barnaby. <laughs> Alexander. <laughs> Squires. <Is it? laughs> David, Mark, he's got a couple of them, doesn't he? <laughs> Oxlade, Chamberlain. <laughs> uh, Jorginho, Wijnaldum. Yeah. And... James Milner. I don't want to risk Henderson. I don't think he's going to be 100%. Hawks, Ginny, Milner. Yeah, and Fabinho. He's, I don't want to take that gamble. Though it is a gamble not playing him. But. It's a big call. Cool. Take your time. Henderson, if he's fit. Juan Alden and Oxley chamberlain Because we're behind, we're going to be chasing the game. Yeah, Henderson definitely plays me. I know you want to go last because you're going to throw like a curveball in here. <laughs> He's playing Trent in midfield. I think, <laughs> I think Henderson's got to play, I think, mentally for Atletico. That's such a massive name on the team sheet. They'll know exactly what he's like. There's one in their faces in that game. Milner, I think you would need a little bit of Milner against something. You need a bit of that nitty gritty attitude. Um, the third spot is a really interesting one for me. I think, obviously, Oxley chamberlain has played really well when he's come into the team. He's, he's proved that he can do you know, be really consistent and put a really consistent performance in. But I think every time Cater has played in Europe, he's played really well. I think the Bayern Munich game, I think of Barcelona before he got injured. So he's coming into my side. Okay, I was going to put Milner in, but I actually think the way the game goes, he's good to bring on in the second half. Because if Liverpool want to protect a lead, he'd be good to introduce. And that's also why Fabinho is not starting. So I'm going to go with Jorginho, Juan Aldum, Jordanium, Henderson, and Nabulus Cater. I agree. I think he's 52.75 million. Let's throw him in there and see what he does. I think Liverpool, they can't go with Fabinho Henderson, one Aldum against Let's Go Madrid because that, that was the first game and they didn't work. Yeah. It's going to be completely the same. So they need something a bit different. Cater, surely, has surely. to. Surely, prove a point. Well, not prove a point. He just has to be fit for 90 minutes. Because yeah. even if he gets 120. to 120. Well, I, say- I was about to say, even <laughs> if he goes to 120. Liverpool can make the subs. Is it four subs, by the way? Yeah, you get an extra minute. Yeah, 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 so basically, there's there's every chance you're going to see Milner, Leilane, Fabinho. Who's the good penalty takers? Milner's obviously one. Yeah. Fabinho. Fabinho. Lallana? 
Well, honestly, Peter, yeah. yeah, Salah. Salah. Yeah. Actually, uh, sorry, Alexander Arnold. He's another one. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. there's, they've got enough pen. Not Manny, though. No. Not Manny. You're not trusting no. him. No, 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 no. Stay Bef- away. Before we conclude, <laughs> I would like some score predictions. I'll come to you first. Oh, right. Well, ah, right. Let's come to the going to score. I agree. Uh, I think it's going to be 2 1 to Liverpool are out. Sorry. Okay. Liverpool are going to concede. So, but we're going to go through 3 1. Big game. Liverpool are going to concede. So now all three of us have said that. It's a clean sheet and a breeze. Uh, Liverpool are going out. They can't reach the final every year. I'm sorry, football fans. That's not how it works. 1 0. Wow, we've killed him here. <laughs> <laughs> um, You've won the Premier League. That's it. Wow. That's, yeah, you'd have seen yourself at the start of the season. I and agree. I agree if Let It Go score. I think it's a massive uphill battle for Liverpool to score three against one of the best defences in Europe. You're going to say five. But I'm going to say 3 1 anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Hope you're right. Anyway, we will be live from that game on the Echo website where you can follow every single kick if you haven't got one of the main TV channels. And we will be back on Friday to discuss hopefully a Liverpool win and a sensational progression after City get beaten by Arsenal in the league and everything is a wonderful, wonderful picture. (laughs) And Andy Gonagan's getting a statue. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you very much for listening.